This is Nuance. I'm Mike Scala, joined once again by Jay Carter, the chair of BLM Tokyo, as well as the hip hop artist Timid. How are you over there in Japan? Uh, doing okay. Jury, jury morning. Um, but, uh, you know, doing all right. A little bit of an, an allergy morning for me. So, mm. How about yourself out, out there? Doing well. Busy. Working on some house stuff, working on cases, you know, got some music in the works. Well, it's all uh -oh. good. Uh-oh, some music in the works. That's right. And we'll talk about how that's relevant in a few minutes here. But I want to introduce our guest, Martin Kohlberg. He's the president of the Woodhaven Residence Block Association for the second time. Good to have you with us, Martin. Hey, Mike. Thank you for having me, Jay. Pleasure to meet you. Nice meeting you, too. So let's talk about this music and, in particular, the bill that is put forth in the legislature, it will pass the Senate, it's waiting to pass the assembly and of course be signed by the governor. But this bill was being promoted of all places at Summer Jam. Right, the one about banning uh, lyrics from criminal trials. Right, and some controversy, obviously hip hop artists are pushing for it. And I think there's good reason to push for it because you do see sometimes in society, not just in the context of trials, but in society, hip hop lyrics being viewed in too much of a literal sense, I think as compared to other forms of expression. And sometimes people think what you say on a song incriminates you or it says something about you, whether, whether you know, it could be you just telling the story or what have you. We talked about this before. If someone was in a movie or in a play saying something a little crazy, no one would bat an eye, but if it's in a rap song, all of a sudden it means that you're a terrible person. So I think there's something to that idea. Yeah, but uh, yeah, exactly. At the same time, though, um, you got to be fair. A lot of the artists represent what they rhyme about as reality, as their reality. So, you know, it, it kind of says, yeah, it's like, how can you have both ways, I guess? You know, yeah, you know, I'm the realist. This is everything I rhyme about. My whole life is this. Uh, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> No, 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 I didn't mean that. Um, but what if you said you were the realist in a song, but that also is part of your creative expression? Right, no, absolutely. I think, I think it comes down to um, some point, the, the artist being kind of honest as well. I mean, like, you know, look, it's a rap song, you know, um, even the persona of being the realist and being this, this hardcore, you know, whatever I'm representing is part of it. You know, not sell that as the real me, you know, this is maybe a character that I'm playing, or this is the role that it is, you know. So it should be a case-by-case -case basis based on how the artist portrays himself or herself in song or in the public? Um, I It could be, because, you know, you can't tell, there's not going to be a blanket way of artist expression. You know, some will rap or deliver exclusively, you know, real topics of their lives, and some will play a character. We've seen Lots of people play characters, um, so. Well, what this does, this particular bill, is it creates a presumption against introducing it in evidence. It doesn't say that it can never be used, mm. but they're going to default to the position of it not being used unless there's a showing that it really needs to come in. And they lay out four factors here. There needs to be a showing by clear and convincing evidence that the lyrics or the creative expression is literal rather than figurative or fictional whether there's a strong factual nexus between a creative expression and specific facts of the crime alleged, whether there's relevance to an issue, which is always the case on the last in there, whether there's distinct probative value not provided by other admissible evidence. So that one is interesting. In other words, you don't have other evidence that could prove what you're trying to prove. You need the lyrics to make your case. Yeah, I don't know if you, uh, yeah, I think you would need the evidence instead of the lyrics because the, the, again, the, the, the lyrics could just be made up. You know, it could be whatever rhymes. Both, but in order to bring in the lyrics, you have to be able to prove that whatever you're trying to prove with these particular lyrics can't be proven completely without the lyrics. Yeah, I don't, I don't know how I feel about that. It doesn't seem like that should be the case. I mean, because again, the lyrics could just be made up. Well, that's also part of what the test is here, right? They have to be literal rather than figurative or fictional. Right. But how do you really prove that? That's, you know, it, it creates this whole hearing process before the judge, so there's no jury to consider it. And the court has to consider 
whether these factors were met. Did you prove that this is literal expression? I guess that goes back to what you were talking about earlier. Has the artist made statements to that effect? Everything I talk about is literal or not. You know, I guess that, that would all be relevant in this hearing. Something else that has become a point of contention is it's not only about rap lyrics. It says evidence of a defendant's creative or artistic expression. And so that always raises the issue. Where is the line? When does something become creative or artistic? It's, I mean, it's easy to see in a song or a painting or something. What if it's just someone writing something online, like a manifesto, but there's some flowery language in there? What if, what if there's some rhymes in there? What if they do something that makes it look like it's creative, but it really is speaking to something devious, maybe a criminal mind state? Yeah, I mean, I think I think that's where you're going to have to have other evidence come into play. Um, you can't just rely on on one thing and you know, it would be unfair to because of that creative expression. Um, and, you know, going to rap, going to rap lyrics, I think the unfair thing is that, I mean, again, a lot of rappers give that persona that this is what's real, this is what we rhyme about. But there is also an unfair factor that rappers are looked at to as, you know, Oh, this is going to be this can be evidence this can be real stuff here and other like you said before movies and all this that you know they're not looked at in that same way and it's a common thing when someone who happens to rap as a criminal defendant they're always pulling up their lyrics and trying to use them against the defendant on the, the uh, trial is that really fair they don't really do that in other forms of media no they don't i, I think yeah there there is a, a, a discriminatory factor there um, and, you know, ultimately there is an anti-blackness factor there as well. So, um, and it's not new. We've seen it for, for decades since, you know, sure. beginnings of rap, you know, this, the whole visceral reaction to rap becoming a, a, a medium has always been played a part. Martin, feel free to jump in. If you don't want to comment, no need to, but if, you know. Yeah, no, no, no. I'm just, just listening to you guys on it. Yeah. I, I think some of it is true though. We, we there has to be you know, some form also of accountability on, on the expressions you're taking and the lyrics you're using, you know, especially if, JT, your point, at some point you're saying, well, yeah, this is my life, right? Like when we talk about maybe they're saying I'm expressing how my life used to be, right? Or the things I used to do and then try and turn it into a positive, you know, um, but, if, uh, you know, I think if, if you're talking about, you know, how you're actively living today, right? And that's leading into certain type of crimes, then you should understand that there's a possibility that that's going to probably come up in a case against you in the future, right? Um, and if that's really the life you're about, then, you know, I guess that that's really your choice, right? That you want to be about that life. That, but these days, there's a lot of other options, right? Um, and, and there's we, we've seen the cases of tons of rappers out there that, uh, you know, went from, you know, the street life into rapping and now into successful other avenues and businesses and all type, even within music, right? Um, you know, but I, I think, you know, people just have to understand in everything we do, we still have to have some accountability. So. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. And, and I think the difference, one of the differences um, in, in, in rappers that are, you know, presenting these type of lyrics and versus actors in movies you know, Brad Pitt doesn't come out and be like, or, or Arnold Schwarzenegger doesn't come out and be like, no, no, I really go out and, and, and shoot people. Like, I don't, you know, like it's understood that this is a character that they're playing. Um, so right. I think that's one well, of the I've things. had songs where I was clearly playing a character and some people didn't take it that way because they yeah. thought that this was hip hop. Hip hop is supposed to be real, right? There's no sophistication in the medium. It's just everything straightforward because you can't possibly be very creative. It's, it's rap. Some people think that way. Right. No, and absolutely. I mean, I remember, you know, what was it? Um, in one of the campaigns, someone had, had dug into some of the old lyrics and it wasn't even your lyrics. They were EJ's lyrics. And he was talking about uh, punching cops. But the character he was rapping from was of a prisoner in jail and his feelings on being in that position. And then in that same verse, he actually talked about how wrong he was and he kind of learn the lesson. So it was a cautionary tale. Right. They want to take a, a little piece of it and say, oh, uh, get any scholars confidence. with this, right. scholars with this guy that's that's advocating for violence getting caught. It's like, no, are you are you listening? What, what is, and Jay-Z's line, do you 
do you fools listen to music or do you just skim through it? Right. Now, also, of course, people will bring up the First Amendment in this and say, well, you have freedom of speech, freedom of expression. So what you say creatively should not be used against you by the government in any capacity. And there's something to that as well. Now, if I was the lawyer now, even without this new bill, if it became law, just under the current law, if I was a criminal defense lawyer, which I don't practice criminal defense, but if that was my client, I would make the argument of relevance now. And I would say, my client does like, you know, let, let's say I had someone who has some rap lyrics out there, but he didn't live that life. I would say he has indicated, he's shown, demonstrated who he really is. And this is not that. So what you're trying to do is you're trying to prejudice the jury with these crazy lyrics, but that prejudice, the, you know, whatever you're trying to prove here, whatever probative value the lyrics have is substantially outweighed by the amount of prejudice that you're going to give the jury. And that's an argument that you can make even today. But this would do those, would take it a step further and just presume that those lyrics can't come in unless the other side shows they really, really, really need to. Right. Yeah, so. well, we'll see how that how that plays out. It's interesting that it played out at um, Summer Jam, but I guess, you know, I don't know how, how Summer Jam gets political or, or on things. It's kind of a first. It's good. It's, I mean, it's, it's always good to combine entertainment with activism or politics or whatever it is. I think that's a good thing. All I know is apparently New York, there's a new king of New York. And uh, yes. some some guy named Fivio, uh, Fivio Foreign had crowned okay. himself king of New York at uh, Summer Jam. I've never heard of the guy, so. Oh, wow. I know of him from Nas's album, a couple albums ago, King's Disease. Oh, okay. But anyway, I wanted to put the poll question up. Before we move on to the next topic, I wanted to put the poll question up because we were going to ask a poll on this particular subject, right? Yeah. So the question for the week is, do you believe that creative expression should be barred from evidence in criminal trials? Mm. The kind of response we get. But yeah, what's your what's your take on that, Martin? We'll see. I don't know. I think people might think that that's too broad, and quite honestly, the bill is written in a pretty broad way. Right. So we'll see how it goes. Yeah, I, I think you know it goes into where do you draw that line of creative impression then, right? You know, I mean, especially with the use of social media these days, not just by rappers, right? You know, uh, and any, you know, if someone can go on and make a video and they can say, well, you know, I may not have been rapping, but that's a fake lifestyle I was living. It was just to be on YouTube, you know, and stuff like that, but yet they committed a crime. Um, right. So that does that mean that that can't be used for evidence? You know, right. so I think, you know, and just like some of these laws when they're in their infancy, right? You have to be very careful with the wording and, and make sure you go into the full details of what you're trying to pass. Yeah, absolutely. The concern, I think, is that somebody, well, someone's lawyer will try to bar something someone said from evidence by saying, no, they were just being creative. <laughs> right. right. Yeah. So interesting. Anyway, I wanted to get more local and talk about. Woodhaven and in particular what is going on in Woodhaven and what the Block Association has been working on. So Martin, anything you'd like to bring to our attention? Yeah, and uh, you know, going into being creative, that's what we're trying to do. You know, and that's what we've always been trying to do, you know, for over almost 50 years now, right? Uh, you know, advocating and, and working for the residents, unpaid for work, you know, for the residents of Woodhaven. Um, a lot of things are around, you know, uh, hot topics as always this time of the year is uh, crimes that certain to happen to come around every time of year in the summer, right? You know, uh, Woodhaven's a very big, diverse community. Obviously, with a lot of changes that have gone on in the city, we have a lot more families here in Woodhaven. It's a little more affordable to live here than some of the other boroughs that have been just, you know, working families probably been priced out, you know. Um, so with that comes along a lot more of these, you know, local community uh, crimes and issues and complaints, you know. So we're trying to get ahead of that, working with, uh, you know, uh, community Board 9, NYPD, who now has a new uh, commanding officer who just stepped in uh, last week. Um, you know, so trying to just make sure we can stay ahead of any potential issues, you know, that may come up, things that we know come around every year. You know, like the guys on the dirt bikes and the ATVs, you know, um, how can we curb that? You know, the, uh, the, the, the racing, you know, that comes from Forest Park and from, and, and from, uh, from the mall there on Atlantic Avenue by the stop and shop. You know, th those are things that, you know, residents here are complaining about and we have to be careful with, you know, and then there's also other types of crimes, right? Uh, you know, we know, you know, Woodhaven is not this, you know, pretend fake, you know, perfect community. 
you know, there, there's things that we have to do that are related to drugs, you know, related to other serious type of crimes that we pay attention to. Um, and we try and, you know, again, work with the NYPD, work with the DA's office and saying, hey, look, you know, we see patterns here, you know, and these patterns uh, of being allowed to be repeated, uh, you know, and the community needs help. And that's where we hope then we escalate and then try and get our elected officials involved and things like that, you know. And then there's also the, the give back portion of it where we try to work with all the organizations and try and, you know, uh, we did a lot of food drives, you know, during COVID, a lot of giveaways, a face mask, you know, um, the board of the WRBA works very hard collectively um, and individually, right? Because again, we're, we're volunteers, um, you know, some of us are still working. Uh, and we have board members who, you know, they come up with an idea or, or they're able to have a connection with an a elected official and, and they'll run with it, you know, and that's usually what we do as long as it's the right thing for the community, you know, and, and it's something that the community is going to benefit from. We, we try our best to make it happen. Excellent. And can you tell people where and when the Black Association is meeting now? Because I know obviously during COVID, people weren't really meeting in person, but when I was campaigning even a lot of people weren't aware that there were meetings that people can go to and I think if more people knew they would join so can you just let everyone know how to get involved oh yeah no definitely you know uh locally we, we're one of the only civics that continue to have meetings throughout the summer uh so we meet every month uh right now we're meeting only at one location at the Manual Church on 91st Avenue and Woodhaven Boulevard uh we meet on at noon this month's meetings coming up on the 25th uh Saturday the 25th at noon uh, you know, we normally get our elected officials or, or at least their representatives. Uh, we get representation for the 102 precinct. Every now and then we'll bring in a guest speaker. Um, and those are things where we sit down and it's usually about two hours um, and we talk, it's all local. You know, it's all let them visit our residents, you know, if they need to, to be vocal and, and vent a little, because sometimes that's what we need to do. We need to get it out, right? Uh, because if you hold it in, you know, and that's one thing that we try and tell residents, you know, whether they let it out to us in, in public or in private, they have to let it out because you hold it in, that becomes frustration. Frustration turns into anger. And then the next thing you know, we're hearing about neighbors having fights and then having these big disputes and it becomes something bigger than what it should have been. So that's why we encourage, you know, we utilize Facebook a lot. You know, we're trying to look at other avenues and other, you know, other ways we can promote ourselves and, and promote the community for residents to come out, right? Uh, we just did a great paint and sip event on Sunday, which is a lot more painting than sipping. There was no alcohol involved, right? So, um, but it was a great thing to talk about mental, mental health and, and wellness, you know? And what I enjoyed the most about that event was it was packed with all locals from different ranges within, you know, ethnicities, from different age ranges as well, you know? And everyone had a great time you know, uh, and people got up, we allowed the, we allowed them to come up and maybe talk about if they have a, a business, right? A small business. Uh, we had two young ladies get up and just talk about themselves being happy that they're in college and they're doing great, you know, and what they want to do in the future. And that, that was one of the things that got like the biggest applause, you know, that they felt comfortable enough because they were really shy about it at first, but it was like, once they stood up and you gave them that forum, boom, a light went off and they went with it. You know, so I think sometimes that's what we try to push with our community is, you know, conversations, you know, empowering people to say, hey, you know, open up a little more. It's OK. You know, um, and, and we, we always say, you know, sometimes we're going to stumble and sometimes some of these issues take time. Right. You know, for us to resolve but we should try to resolve them as a community. So. Absolutely. It sounds that sounds like a good uh, event. And it, it's something that sounds like it can bring the community together. Right. When people in the community, meet with other people in the community, you just become a community, you know? There's a, there's a De La Soul lyric that goes, um, hoods become hoods when there's, neighborhoods become hoods when there's no neighbors in them. Yep. And so I thought there's always a good line. And if people have that sharing and that coming together, then, you know, there's more of a caring about the community and about the people in it. Yeah, right. exactly. You know, and then there's, you know, just like last week, Mike, called up to drop off, you know, three boxes of books, right? Uh, we started doing a book drive and that was started by two of our board members, uh, Janet and Janet or Janet Square, we, we called them, you know, because, but, you know, this was during COVID where they were giving out other things, face masks and it was, well, what else we can do? We have some books, let's see if, if, the, if, you know, the general public wants books. And 
that day they sold out like everything went out the door and i mean sold out meaning it's free you know they took them every anything we had they took um so they said all right well now we have to do a drive where we can collect books because we, we have no more books to give out you know and that was something that now it's a routine that they want to do because we see the interest in the community and again one of the the best stories that you know that they bring out from each one of these drives and i think they're going to be they're coming up on the fourth one that's going to be done since covid um is again the young community that comes up to the tables and look through the books you know and and they ask oh can i take this book can i take this book and they're like of course you can you know and just to see them want to grab a book and how happy they are that you know maybe they'll go home and read something they, they never read before you know um but that's what it is right that community involvement uh this past weekend as well saturday we had this huge yard sale, uh, which we had 51 homes sign up. And, and this is a rough estimate. I would say out of the 51, 45 actually set up. The weather was a little, you know, sketchy a little Saturday. It seemed like it was going to rain. Um, but again, it, it lets people come out of their house, sell some things, meet their neighbors. You know, uh, the joke around Woodhaven is, yeah, try and get rid of as much of the new stuff you're going to buy, right? Because uh, some of these people buy things from their neighbors too. Uh, you know, one of our board members and I were driving around to the locations and we bumped into people, a mother and a son who came all the way in from Coney Island. You know, we had a guy who walked over from Glendale. That's such a great idea, though, because people try to do yard sales on their own all the time and then complain nobody showed up. Right. I spent all this effort and I didn't get anyone to come out. But if you have a coordinated effort where 50 families around the town are doing it, you make it a big event. Now, like you said, even people doing the yard sales are supporting each other, people coming from out of town. It's a big deal now. And now you actually have some business, right? It actually, it works. It, it's everyone supports, again, it goes back to community, people helping each other, supporting each other. Right, exactly. And that's what we want to do. And from the WRBA side, you know, we, we'll go out and we're setting this up. You know, one of our board members take it from, you know, beginning to end, working with, 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 with the community to how to set it up. We have a Facebook page for it now. But the other thing is to follow up with them with, hey, if you can't make it to the meetings, there's an opportunity to speak to someone from the board. What's your issues? Do you want to, you know, do you at least have our information outside of this yard cell where, you know, you, you can come to us for issues, you know, and, and we do get that a lot, you know, because, again, you know, uh, it's hard these days. Right. You know, families are working. Sometimes most cases, both parents are working. Right. You have multiple kids in the house who are probably into activities, all kind of different sports after school activities. Um, so not everyone has time to go to a civic meeting, right? So we have to find a way to get creative to still engage these people, right? And still engage them and want to be part of our community. I'm glad you brought that up because in Woodhaven in particular, I found that to be an issue that you have a very diverse population in Woodhaven who seems to be disconnected from what's going on in the community through no fault of their own it's because they're working very busy lives to try and put food on the table. But I think there needs to be outreach to ensure that more of the community is involved because it is beneficial to everybody. Yeah, exactly. And, and that's the reason why we try to network with other, with other civics. You know, we work very closely with our elected officials. You know, we, we work very closely with the Woodhaven bid, you know, uh, CB9 to try and get the word out about the organization, what we've been doing for close to 50 years, you know, and how, you know, we survive because of community involvement, right? You know, again, uh, the board consists of uh, seven board members who are, you know, all volunteers, you know, uh, outside of a new one that we who, who just joined last month. But that person has been a resident, you know, almost all her life. You know, um, we most of us on this board has been been on that board for over 10 years, you know, uh, because we care. Uh, we, we've seen our numbers, meaning, you know, uh, individuals wanting to get involved dwindle a little. Right. Because of that. Right. Because of life coming up and. Your kids grow and now they're in college and now you're a little more worried and trying to keep and you don't have time to do things, but we still have to continue to find a way to be more creative with our outreach and find, you know, and find ways to still keep those people involved. Right. Um, you know, because at the end of the day, either whether you're a homeowner or a renter. Right. We still want to hear from you. Right. This isn't an organization for one or the other. It's an organization for the community. Um, and we want everyone to be part of it. Um, and we want every issue small or big you know to be handled because one of the things you know back from even when edwin dell was president steve forte and myself you know we say is the only way we can fix things is by two things one knowing about it and two working together on it 
Absolutely. Right. And that, that's also why I think it's important to go to a meeting like that if you have an issue, because sometimes you might call the police on something and not figure, you know, to get it, you're not getting the response that you want. Maybe it's a recurring problem. But if you go to a meeting and you bring it up and oftentimes not just elected officials, but the precincts will be there. And that now it becomes a community issue. Right. You kind of right. put it exactly. on the radar in a way where it wasn't before. And then you have advocates like Martin and, and the board and everyone else fighting for the issue now. But you have to speak up. Otherwise, it's not going to be known. Yeah, and, and, and we have some great residents too that attend our meetings where they'll say, hey, look, you know what? I dealt with that on my own a year or two, six months ago. And these were the steps that I took and they were very successful. Or they say, hey, I've been dealing with that same issue for two years and it seems like I had a war. I don't know what to do. So now we go, okay, now we have numbers, right? right. Let's make sure that, and that's why we always say 311, 911, you know, a, a notepad by your window, you know, anything you can do to keep track of that data so that we can take that back to someone and say, look, this isn't a myth, right? This isn't like some random, you know, snowman that's running around a Bigfoot Woodhaven that no one ever sees or hears about. No, this is true. Here's the data. Here's when it's happening, who it's happening to, and we want a response, right? There's, you know, there's things that are happening in every community, you know, that are low hanging fruit, right? That NYPD, DOT, Department of Sanitation, they all should be able to handle those low hanging fruits. Right. Sometimes I call it, uh, you know, underhand curveballs. I mean, uh, underhand softballs that I'll throw at, at the precinct. I'm like, yeah, this is an easy one. You should be able to knock this out the park, you know. Right. Um, but but those are things that if we don't present those issues, sometimes they never get resolved. And and the more yeah. of those smaller issues that they that they handle and handle quickly, then the better things can can become. The residents relax a little bit. Everything, you know, feels just a little bit better. Exactly, because then you can understand, all right, now they need time to handle those bigger issues, right? There right. are some things, you know, especially when, you, when you're talking about things where it, it, it's an escalation from like a summons from DOT or for Department of Buildings, and you're talking about more like now they're taking, a, 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 you know, a, a, like a property we had on 79th Street that was abandoned for, for 10 years, you know, and we looked at laws from DOB, Mike, you know, remember that where they said, hey, um, you know, a structure doesn't need a roof to be deemed safe. I was like, wow, that seems pretty weird that you can say that, but okay. You know, and luckily, you know, going back to being the squeaky wheel, we had our local council member for that district, Rob Holden, step up, make noise again with DOB, with the sheriff's department, and it started the process all over again. You know, so it was, you know, either we have an abandoned building that people were saying, you know, at one point, oh, it's the building that burnt down 10 years ago. There was never a fire. It was just a roof that a roof that collapsed and a, a slumlord of a landlord. Right, that that's how bad it looked. Up. Right, it was in such it, disrepair. People thought it was a big fire. A big wow. fire. Yeah, I mean, this thing had no roof, no windows. You know, uh, big green graffitied up plywood up and garbage. The the dumping that was happening on that corner uh, was, was was getting a little very out of control. You know, uh, past President Steve Forte put in complaints. You know, for cleanups or CB nine, we go there, we clean up. I would do the same thing. I would call Bob Holden and be like, dude, we got to start this back up and get this done. And again, the residents on that corner started putting in 311s for us for no lighting, you know, for the graffiti, for the dumping. You know, we have uh, what we call um, uh, WRBA warriors, you know, and one of the ones on that block, she kept on reporting back to us every little thing that was happening that we can use, again, as true data, you know, mm -hmm. and that helped us get to a point where the city took that building down they put up a, you know, a, a fence. And yes, we have an abandoned, uh, an empty lot right now, but that empty lot's been maintained. There's, there hasn't really been any dumping. There's no complaints of safety because that corner was so dark as well, right? Because this big, dark, burnt out building was sitting there for 10 years, you know, that it actually brought a little life back to that corner, even though now you have an empty lot, you know, but that's something too that we want to work with elected officials to see, you know, now what can we do with that lot for this community? And, and my, you know, what I like to use with that when I talk to them about it is that's kind of payment back to this community for the pain and suffering for over 10 to 12 years, you know, of having to deal with that. And in some, and in, in all fairness of our resources and our money, right, to having to clean that lot up, to having to send extra police over there for certain activities that were going on, you know, for 10 years, you know, so I truly believe that could, that, that should come back to the community of Woodhaven as some type of community center where you can have after school programs, you know, where you can have programs for seniors, you know, maybe a small little park there, you know, with some chess boards and checkers and stuff like that, 
So, you, you know, seniors and kids don't have to travel all the way up the road to Forest Park, right? You know, th that, that's where you can give some real positive impact to local communities. And that's what I'm hoping we can get from the city. Absolutely. Woodhaven deserves it. Woodhaven also deserves not losing Nears Tavern, right? I know there's been a big battle over that, trying to get landmark status. I wrote a letter trying to get at that landmark status, but there's been an issue. For those who don't know, it's really a landmark and it should be designated as such. The oldest bar in New York might be the oldest bar in the U.S. by some standards. It's Goodfellas was filmed there in some parts. May West got her start there. I mean, really a part of New York City history, to say the least. Yeah, no, no, definitely. And, and I'm, uh, you know, I guess you could say I'm a little, you know, uh, biased with Nears because I go there a lot. You know, uh, food's good, drink's good, and the conversation's usually even better, right? Um, it's one of those things that I, that I say about this community um, where you can step into that place and within two minutes, it's a hello, how you doing? First time here, you know, and the next thing you know, you're chatting all night. You know, or if it's karaoke going on, you know, someone's going to egg you on to sing and then you're going to regret it the next day. You know, yeah, like, but it's one of those fun local places that, like Mike said, it's been around. It, 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 it's part of not just Woodhaven history, it's part of New York's history. Right. So and we, we lose our history almost every day in the city for some reason. We think that it's good to wipe things out and build fresh every time. Right. Um, you know, establishments like Nears, you know, need to stay around. A lot of other communities have some as well that they lost over the years. And it's shame, right? You lose that local feel of going into that nice little pub that you have, you know, to have a drink, to meet your neighbors. You know, we still have a few of those here. You know, some of them haven't been around as long as Nears. Um, but hey, Jordy's Joint and Jamaica Avenue, same thing. You walk in and, and both of them kind of have the same feel, you know, you know, first, you, everyone turns around and looks at you like, all right, who's the new guy? And then five minutes later, you're not the new guy, <laughs> you know. Um, but that, that's, that, that's what's great about a community like Woodhaven. And that's what keeps me here. I know that. I mean, you know, um, I have a busy life. You know, I'm still working. Uh, you know, I, I, I love to be try and be active, um, not sports wise, obviously, but just going out and, and having fun and meeting people. But I like doing it in my community, too. You know, I, I love, you know, the, the, the diversity of the types of food that we have on the avenue. love to see some other type of businesses coming in and giving us a shot. Um, also like seeing people when you go into our, you know, certain events and, 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 and establishments in our community and you hear people from other communities coming in, you know, uh, to enjoy our community. That's a great thing. You know, we, we want a lot more of that. We want to share our community. You know, these are all our streets are open to anyone anywhere to come and enjoy with us. Right. But we That's also great. want to make sure that we work with our elected officials, with our local precincts, you know, to make sure that everyone is safe, right? Uh, and that, that's the main thing. And I want to give a shout out to the late Maria Thompson because her baby was the Woodhaven Street Fair and that lives on till this day. And if you want to sample some of the food on the avenue, I mean, what better time to do it, right? Yeah, exactly. And actually that's coming back this year as well. So the Woodhaven Street Fair will come back uh, in September. Uh, you know, that's being put on uh, now by the Woodhaven bid. Um, and yes, Maria Thompson is, is a huge, you know, staple whose, uh, you know, name still goes around in Woodhaven. You know, right there in Forest Parkway and Jamaica Avenue, there's, there were uh, co-naming for her there. Um, and there was a reason for that, right? You know, she was civically involved for, I believe it was over 40 years, you know, with being part of the WRBA, uh, being part of the bid, you know, and she laid down the foundation for, you know, how to be tough as a civic leader, right? To get what you want, you know, um, yes, you have to play nice, you know, and you have to be, you know, professional. But sometimes, you know, you have to pick up the phone, take the person off speaker, right? And just give it to them, right? Uh -huh. And let them understand that, you know, they do have a job that they have to do for this community. And the community, going back to what I said earlier, you know, accountability, right? We will hold you accountable. You know, and, and that's, that's, that's necessary. Yeah. You know, and I think, you know, if we had a lot more communities that would step up and do that in organizations to just say, I get it. We have to play nice with our elected officials. Right. You know, and with our local precincts. And yes, we need to support and support other organizations. But let's make sure we're also holding them accountable, just like we should be holding ourselves accountable. All right. I have a question related to that. Do you think is a good thing or a bad thing that Woodhaven has two city council members? So it's a good question. I think it's, it's a double-edged sword, right? It kind of feels like with two, you have more power in the council, right? To push, you know, uh, some kind of common sense and, and show trend, right? 
to where it's not just one person saying, hey, this is what's going on in my district, right? You actually have two professionals and elected officials who can say, no, we do see it throughout both parts of the district, right? And they can team up and say, you know, again, yes, this is something as, as council members, we should be able to fix. And not only that, I think have conversation with other com with council members about to say, is this happening in your community, right? Because it can't just be in, in our two districts. And if it is something that's happening in your community, then this should be the number one topic that we should be, one of the number one topics we should be looking at, right? And making sure that they prioritize that properly. So, you know, um, it's kind of a hard question because, you know, because yes, it can probably be better if you only have one because sometimes it creates confusion, right? Where's that borderline of who represents who? Right, and it can cause, I think, a dilution of the neighborhood's power at the same time. Yeah, right. You know, and then that's the thing. That's why it's kind, of, it's kind of like a double-edged sword, right? It's a very difficult, I, in my opinion, a difficult question to just answer with one answer, right? Um, because you, you can lose some of your power in the numbers, right? Uh, because there is a split. Now, um, luckily, we, we've been, uh, you know, lucky with the representatives that we have from both, for both districts where, you know, most of the time we don't hear okay, where's the address? Who's the person? Because they want to see if it's the, in their district, you know? Um, but yeah, you know, sometimes you think of, you say, well, I'm carrying everyone in Woodhaven. That's a big, that's a, that's a big hammer you can wield, right? And, and, and city council. Um, right. But, you know, and I think that's where, you know, things can get, a, can get a little hairy and a little funny, but I just think just in general, you know, our city council needs to do better anyway. Um, and not speaking, you know, directly about our representatives. I'm just saying the council as a whole. At really looking at what are bothering, what are the biggest topics for civics, right? And for the average persons in our in our communities, right? Um, some of the things that we see that pass through the city council, and that kind of pass quick, you know, like so of a sudden someone's flavor of the month, and you see a bill pass and it's going quick. But yet issues that we talk about throughout communities for like five, six, ten years. They're still debating on, you know, and and we, that needs to change. That needs to be fixed. This is a great city, you know. I think Woodhaven, and and again because I live here and I love it, is one of the you know one of the great towns in, in our city, you know, one of the great areas. Um, but this is the, you know this is a great city. We have a lot of great people in our city that are civic minded. They're involved, but you know uh, we get frustrated. We get frustrated with the slow process of our city, which is supposed to be the biggest and best city in the world, right? But yes, some of our policies are very outdated and they, yes. they hurt us. Some of our infrastructure even, I'm always frustrated looking at the transit infrastructure of New York City. How come very we're the outdated. major city oh, yeah. in the country where there's no direct rail link between the airport and the center of the city? I think we should be talking about high-speed rail by now, going from New York to DC in a very fast amount of time, but we're nowhere near that level. We still can't even get our local infrastructure correct. And, and right, and, and it's a good point because in Woodhaven, one of the biggest topics that we bring up is parking. You know, uh, and, it, and it goes back to Mike, what you said, this is a working class community. These are people, you know, individuals who even if they're, they're retired, seniors who need to get to their doctors, you know, they need to, they wanna go visit their kids and grandkids. And because of the way our transit system is set up, Unfortunately, the MTA is not the best option right now. You know, crime aside, you know, uh, where it doesn't make sense for me to take a train and two buses to get to point A, and then it'll take me an hour and a half to two hours to get back home, right? right. right. Um, but parking but yeah, is a nightmare, as you're well aware. I've heard right. so many horror stories coming out of Woodhaven where people would drive to work, come home, couldn't find a parking spot, so they would just sit in their car all night and get a ticket or something. Like, it's really wild sometimes. Yeah, no, I mean, you, you have seniors going around and have to, you know, they try to go shopping, they unload their bags in front of their home, and then they're circling for an hour or two, and now they have to walk back five, six hours, you know, or someone who just worked a double shift, you know, and they're like, they, they're like, you know what, I'm going to eat that ticket, and they park at an old standing because they give up. We have to find a way, the city has to find a way to be more effective with these issues without just saying, jump on a train or grab a bike. OK, because right. the, the, the thing is, though, even with a bike, if you look at it in Woodhaven, the infrastructure is not even there to take your bike to Forest Park and chain it up. Right. You know, now we're starting to see those things. But we were talking about that for 10 years, you know, um, and at the end of the day, you know, we have to look, you know, how to be proactive with some of these issues. Right. 
we're not going to go away from cars anytime soon, right? Uh, in my opinion, that's that's a that's a, a false fantasy that a lot of our city council members are trying to sell. Right. Okay? They're trying to punish people for driving. When really, they should be making other options more attractive. And they're not. Exactly. Right. But right. they're not. You know, like I would love to say, OK, I'll get a green car. Or I'll get an electric car. I live in an apartment building right now. Where am I going to plug that thing into? Right. right. I'm going to take a chance that I run run out of power and try to get to a parking lot or a mall to plug in. You know, that infrastructure should be starting to be built out. You know, um, we need to be more creative with, with our parking structures. You know, unfortunately, I think, believe, I think last conversation over that city's not doing municipal parking anymore. Right. Um, but we need parking. So even let's say Woodhaven goes and everyone gets a green car. Not everyone lives in, in a home that they can charge. Right. Where do these cars charge them? Now? You know. So, yeah, we need to and we definitely need to find faster, more efficient ways to get to places with the MTA. Um, you know, without punishing uh, uh, New Yorkers with more taxes to cover that. And these, you know, small little taxes that you see in your phone bill and your, you know, your light bill that leads back to the MTA, but yet they always short money. You know? right. right. Well, speaking of taxes, supposedly there was some tax relief at the pump. We were yeah. <laughs> filling up our tanks, which we need to do because we have to drive. But as we were talking before we came on here, we don't really feel... The relief, where is it? I just filled up, it's 60 bucks plus still for my regular car, I don't drive an SUV. What's going on here? Yeah, uh, we were talking about that, right? That that week that they announced and the number was gonna go somewhere from you know 12 to 16 or 18 cents a gallon, you're gonna save because there's no tax. Never, never saw it, never saw it. So I don't know if maybe uh, state needs to look into that, right? And, and see, you know, do an audit to make sure that that tax is actually was dropped. Um, or because you don't see that little plus tax on your receipt anymore, it doesn't mean that that uh, station never dropped that price, right? Um, you know, I, uh, I, some of this has to deal, you know, with, with corporate greed and, and price gouging, in my opinion, yes. you know, um, and, and that's something that, that they have to pay attention to, you know? And this is happening worldwide, too. Some people just want to blame our local leaders here in New York or in the country, but it is happening all across the world. These prices are up. Inflation is a big issue. Right. And then these major um, oil companies have just posted record profits. Um, you know, you, you don't you don't do that if, um, you know, if you're hurting, you know, exactly. It's, it's the people that are hurting because they're they're gouging. And I think a lot of the people are pointing to, like you said, the local leaders or even to the president and, and whatnot, when it's really, you know, these companies that um, are taking advantage of the war in Ukraine and, you know, the recession and saying, oh, well, this is needs to be this because of all of these things. So Vance yeah. in the, Vance in the uh, chat said it's a racket. <laughs> yeah. So Vance is uh, one of my board members and, uh, you know, he, he, he's he, he's one of the few board members that we have that, you know, they stay on top of things and, and we look at it and we try and educate ourselves. Right. So we can have these conversations with the community, you know, cause again, you know, this is, again, this builds frustration. People are just trying to, you know, live and they use that car to go to work and they have to put gas in that vehicle to go do what they got to do or to take their kids to school or to the after school programs. And now they're saying, you know, unfortunately our house homes, we're not having record breaking savings, right. Where we're like, wow, this year I was able to save so much more money. No, we're tapping into our savings. We're tapping into, you know, the little shoe boxes we had stuck in the closet for maybe a vacation next year, right? And at some point you're going to ask, you start asking yourself, when, when does it end? When, when does my pocket get a little relief, right? Um, and it's hard. You know, we have local businesses who were trying to hold on for so long without raising prices, right? Because they know everyone's suffering, but they're getting hit as well. You know, uh, so so we have to be we have to be smart. And I think, you know, that there's there's things too where, again, locally, our city, you know, uh, can have more effective laws that will help small businesses more effectively help, you know, the average citizen where we can see more money back in our pockets. Right. Without having to be taxed for it, getting more services without having to pay for it. Right. You know, things like that. Um, and, and that's what we need. We really need to do. And and. You really need to, you know, have a lot more forward thinking, right? And 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 let's stop, you know, blaming everything, especially around, you know, with funding around COVID, right? And and because that funding that we got from, you know, extra money from state and city, 
that's going to go away, right? Um, so how do you then go past that, but yet keep some of those great positive resources and, and um, you know, uh, ideas that you had that came out of COVID, right? Now they were funded through, through COVID relief funds, but if we lose those funds, we really shouldn't lose those programs, right? Because you see families are benefiting from it. All right, and I think that's where things like that are where organizations like yours um, can also come into play because you put, you put those issues in front of the, the local politicians and, and you know, the organizations and it's, it's directly from the people. And so, you know, they have to, they have to feel it in a sense, you know, because if the people aren't speaking up, then, you know, these organizations, these politicians are going to do what they want to do. You know, when the people are in front of them, it's like, okay, maybe my reelection's in jeopardy. You know, they can keep good. pushing their pet projects, which often, by the way, they get from other groups who are speaking up. Maybe yes. it's certain lobbyists or advocacy groups and, and exactly. maybe even from their district, but they're providing them resources to run their campaigns. A lot of people don't realize that. Some right. of them are unions or whatever the case may be. They all have their agendas, which they should, but the community has this agenda too. And the community needs to use that voice to put the pressure on the politicians the same way these other groups are. Exactly. And, and, and that's why, you know, us being a 501c3, you know, in an organization, we're, we're very neutral. We don't support, you know, uh, any particular uh, elected official in any, you know, in any capacity. But one thing that we do support and that we always tell the community to do is to register to vote and vote, right? Use your voice. You know, that's something we have to do. You know, that's something our past president, you know, he was really pushing uh, Steve Forte on. So, you know, bringing that also back into our educational system, letting kids know early the importance of voting. Right, letting them be part of the process, and that then gives them, you know, that gives you that little civic spark in your head, right? Of wow, my voice does matter, right? Because it does, and I tell people all the time, just know that uh, when you vote locally, city, state, right, um, every vote really, really does count, right? You know, we're going to Fed voting for president. We can talk about that whole mess some other time, right? You know how they set that up, but locally, your voice really does count. You know your 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 elected official tone changes a little when it's you know Mike Scala and his next four next door neighbors knocking on their door and asking for a meeting, right? You know, and they're like, okay, wait a minute, I'm gonna have to listen here. And that's why we ask everyone, look, even if you can't make it, send me an email, send me a text, you know, or if you don't, if you're, you're there's an issue that you don't want to talk about yourself, let me know what that issue is. Let me speak on that for you. But we need to talk about it. You know, um, elected officials can be very creative with their time, right? And, and, and with the projects that they want to push, you know, but then you do have some elected officials that they have the right ideas, they have the right projects, but they don't get the backing. No. And that's a shame, right? And that, that to me is when I say, you know, I use the whole, well, because they don't want to play the same game that other elected officials are playing, they're not getting any of that love, right? Right. I don't know if you saw those report recently where the speaker of the council was accused of not giving out discretionary funds to certain council members who disagreed with her agenda. Now these council members are complaining about that, saying because we didn't play the games that they wanted me to play, our whole district suffers. Right. And and I, I didn't I didn't hear about that, but I think those are things that are good examples for communities to understand, right? It's saying, you know, I shouldn't be shortchanged, right? and other districts and other, you know, communities are getting everything, right? And that goes across the board. That goes across how we do zoning, you know, how housing is set up, you know, how affordable housing is set up, how senior programs are set up, how programs for veterans is set up. You know, there are so many things that we miss in our smaller communities like Woodhaven that other larger communities get. You know, there, there are things that Manhattan gets that we we're like, oh, wow, really? You know, that's, that's and, and that building, just to take it up as another example, again, I was like, if that building was in Manhattan and our elected officials, even going back, you know, they mentioned this, if this happened in Manhattan, it would have taken a week, right, for them to figure out something to fix that roof. And that, and that roof would have had a, uh, that building would have had a roof and it would have been repaired. But because that happened in little old Queens and a little area called Woodhaven, right, it wasn't a priority for them, for any of those agencies. Right. right. And 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 that's that's the wrong. That's not the way we should be governing. You know, um, we all have a voice and we, we need to use it more. 
Absolutely. And on that topic, everyone go out and vote. We have two primaries this year because of a crazy thing that happened up in Albany with the way these lines were redrawn and court cases and whatnot. It's a mess, but we do have two primaries. This past week, actually, another development on that, the assembly lines, which were drawn as part of the process that drew the Senate lines and the congressional lines, which were deemed unconstitutional, also ruled out. However, it's too late to redraw them for this year. So we're going to be dealing with this post-election. The, you know, the drama continues. Nonetheless, this year, if you're a registered Democrat or Republican, you have primary elections. And even the other parties, you know, the working families, technically, although they don't usually have primaries, but go see what your party is and what the candidates are. June 28th and August 23rd are the two primaries. So on June 28th, you will have your primary for governor, for assembly, because it was too late to change, and all related seats that come from that. So you have district leaders in there, you have delegates and so forth. On August 23rd, you'll have your primaries for state Senate and for Congress. It's very important that you go out and vote. They're expecting a low turnout, especially in August, because we don't usually have one in August, but we want to put that word out. And I'm sure the Block Association will, will be putting the word out to everyone that these primaries are happening. And they're very important because this is how you exercise your voice at the community level. All right. Now, Martin, you mentioned social media um, for your group and whatnot. Where can they find um, the association on um, online? Yeah, so we're, we're, we're on Facebook at, uh, you know, Woodhaven Residents Block Association. We also do have a website, uh, woodhaven.info. Sorry, it's a long one, but that website's down right now. We're having issues with it. Um, but we've been, uh, we've been working on it. You know, we're, we're looking at other things, you know, again, you know, maybe we should start utilizing Twitter. You know, we had that Twitter account and how to do it. You know, but it's finding someone who's going to actively be on it, right? Because the last thing you want is to have something and you have still, you know, things going on. But we can definitely be, you know, reached at it's www.woodhaven-nyc.org. Uh, we can be emailed at info at woodhaven-nyc.org. You know, or obviously, like I said, our, our Facebook. And uh, for anyone who wants to uh, give us a ring, it's 718-296-3735. Um, you know, and, and we try to reach out, you know, sometimes to be honest, with you, we'll get calls and emails from uh, other parts in other communities just saying, hey, we don't have a civic organization. Can you just give us guidance on who we can reach out to to help with this issue? You know, and, and I think every civic should do that. Right. Uh, and, and it's a good thing because that's going to hopefully spark that person to continue that conversation in their community and start something. Vance coming through in the clutch with the with the URL in the chat room. There he is, my man Vance. Vance. <laughs> so no, yeah. I wanted to go over the poll results from last week. We asked about banning the sale of dogs, cats, and rabbits from retail shops because this was something that did pass in New York and we wanted to see what people thought about it. Yours, I guess, you know, on your poll, you had a different result than mine. Mine was evenly split right down the middle. I think some people like the idea, but some people are concerned about interfering with private business yeah mine was um the, i ran it in three different places in the community you know the total um it was heavily weighed towards yes there should be a ban on on sales of those and i think i mean there was no context or, or response but you know obviously the idea was to to um get around puppy mills and and these types of things and the awful conditions that the animals go through in that type of environment um so I would assume that that's where, where the results are coming from. Right. No, absolutely. And obviously puppy bills are a big problem and people encourage you to adopt if you can, get a rescue animal. Okay. Yeah. What would you, what's, what's your take on that, Martin? Yeah, I, I think, you know, um, you should try and support rescue as much as you can. You know, uh, but but I think also part of free trade, as long as it's regulated correctly, you know, people should have the option if they want to uh, buy a pet, you know, that meets more of their standards or that's a younger pet that they feel they can have longer for their kid. You know, some people get get a dog at a, at a puppy age that can grow with the child. Right. You know, um, so I, I think really it's, it, it should be more about how do we, you know, regulate and keep an eye on these businesses or these mills. Right. That are happening. And and make sure that the right thing's being done Absolutely. than trying to stop things from happening, you know, of giving people right. options. Because you could still buy a pet from a private breeder, yep. but 
that begs the question then, is there now a difference between having the storefront and not? I mean, whoever is doing the selling should be regulated properly. Yep. Yeah, I think, and then that was kind of what we, we talked on last week that that would be, you know, probably a better option, um, you know, make sure that they're being treated right. And so those things can, you know, then the business, that the retail stores can still have that option and people can have the option like Martin was talking about, you know, you get in your younger ones so the kids can grow with them. Um, Cause you never know if the breeders are, are, you know, treating them right, you know. There's been horror stories with breeders, right? With, with, Absolutely. With, you know, fake, you know, fake breeds being sold, you know, mixed dogs that are being sold as pure breeds, you know, some pure breeds that are, you know, that all of a sudden pass, you know, uh, because they had some kind of uh, illness that the breeder never mentioned, you know? Right. So again, you know, it, it's keeping an eye on, on not really regulating a hundred percent, but making sure that there are guidelines and rules that are being followed and how, you know, whatever uh, body is set to, to, to keep an eye on them and to, to, you know, follow up that they're actually doing that. All right. Agreed. So last topic here, we wanted to touch on briefly, there was a protest when Florida Governor Ron DeSantis came to speak at Chelsea Piers. He was invited by a conservative Jewish group, I believe. There was a protest mainly led by the LGBTQ community because of the controversial law that was signed in Florida by the governor, uh, restricting or really outright banning instruction of sexual orientation to young children in the schools. They call that the don't say gay bill. So of course you have people now saying, don't say Ron DeSantis, there was a big protest. And I think it kind of leads to this larger issue of people coming in to speak or to appear. There are sometimes comedians or musicians or whoever coming to college campuses or other places and you have protests and then people always come back and say, well, what about free speech? And the other side comes back and says, well, that only applies to the government, this is private, but culturally should we be censoring people? It's the larger discussion that we're having in society right now, right? Like, when do people have the right or, or, or should we just allow people to book wh whoever they want and you can show up and not show up or should we be protesting and, and stopping it if we think they don't represent our values? I think um, I, the question I'd like to know is, is when he arrived, was there the smell of sulfur anywhere <laughs> around? That's kind of what I'm curious Valid about. Valid question. And the chance where, hey, hey, ho, ho, Ron DeSantis has to go. <laughs> um, I mean, listen, he's, he's, a, he's a deplorable guy. Um, he's, and I think he's going to be a danger to the country in, in the upcoming, because I'm sure he has bigger aspirations. And his, his way of thinking is, is very antiquated. Um, should he be booked? Unfortunately, he is a governor still. Um, so, you know, but it, it's a university, they have a right to protest, you know? Um, well, this was not a university, right? It wasn't? No, I just gave it as an example, because you often see that at universities where someone is booked to speak at a college or perform right. at a college and the students all protest and you say, people will say, well, then just don't go to the show or don't go to the event, right? What, if they're, if they're spewing this, this negative and hateful rhetoric, um, then you know that the college or whoever's bringing there is kind of you know responsible for helping to spread that message, or is it a message that should be spread? So I mean I understand you know that um, controversy, and um, I think you know yeah I wouldn't want him I wouldn't want him speaking at some point. Right. And if we're speaking of people's rights to speak, sure the organization has a right to book him. The speaker has a right to come speak, but people have a right to say they don't like it, right? We all have absolutely. rights to speak and express our views, whatever they are. Absolutely, absolutely. So, yeah, James in the chat, um, once again, um, hey, James, uh, said that he was blocks away from Stonewall, and it was also on the anniversary of the Pulse shooting. Um, so Stonewall That's another relevant significant. Point. And, and the fact that this is during Pride Month also. Right. And, you know, so, so much of an enemy to that community. Right, so it could be seen as, as being antagonistic um, to bring him there at that time in that location. Um, kind of like how the NRA holds rallies that are pro-gun right in the city of a recent mass shooting right after it happened. Right, yeah. Vance is saying counter his platform with public counterpoints. 
And, you know, that's, that's usually the strategy is like, okay, if he's coming in with these, if someone's coming in with these negative points and you come with the, you know, the, the counter, the factual counter that goes against it, the question becomes, in that case, is like, in the past 10 years or so, we've seen where that doesn't necessarily work so much, especially during, after the Trump era of, you know, alternative facts. Um, and people just not listening to facts and, and keeping that bubble wall very strong around them. Even if you come in with factual information that refutes what someone is speaking about, it's not believed, it's not talked to, it's screamed at for being fake news or whatever it is. And that negativity goes, still goes out and there's no actual discussion and no nuance that's, that's happening. That's always a philosophical discussion is the cure for bad speech, more speech, or is it suppressing the bad speech? Right. Yeah. It's a difficult, a difficult one uh, to do it. Cause you know, we grew up, I remember one of the lessons I remember in, um, in school and I might've been Thomas Paine. I can't remember the name specifically, but there was this always this line that I remember from history class that said, um, that someone said, and I forget was one of the wars that uh, I don't have to agree with what you said, but I'll fight to the death to, for your right to say it. Um, and it might have been Thomas Paine. I could be incorrect, but I always remember that. Um, and I always kind of took that idea, but, you know, that gets challenged when some of the things that they say is so far out there and so negative and, and violent that it's like, is that even something that's defendable? Right. And not all speech is even legal, right? I mean, there are limits even to free speech. If you're inciting violence, then you're not protected. Right. Not saying that's what he was doing in this particular speech, but if right. you're going to, it's, it's dangerous and it's of that variety, then there really is no right to say it in the first place. Right. You know, there has to be a line. There is a line somewhere. And even people who, you know, I've had these conversations with, with some far right wing and some conservatives, even they recognize there's a line somewhere. A lot of them do. Um, it's just, you know, where that line is, is different for everybody. But the fact, I think the fact that we can agree that there's a line somewhere means there is common ground in the talking point that we do agree that it's not an all for not a free for all. So it seems like a place that we can start from. Right. Well, what if there was someone who was more obviously extreme, someone who didn't have any popular support in the country? For example, there is this candidate in upstate New York who said we need people who can inspire crowds like Hitler. What a disgusting thing to say. I think most people now on both sides of the political aisle, I hope, could agree that's a bad thing to say and a bad comparison to make. Now, if someone were to speak like that, would you have people on all sides agree that that probably shouldn't be someone to book or that kind of speech shouldn't be presented to children or, or a captive audience? You know, hopefully that's a, a, a spot where people say, OK, we don't know exactly where the line is, but we know this crosses it. I don't think you would have full agreement on that. Um, and we've seen that. I think what was it? Um, uh, t wasn't it wasn't Time Magazine going to name Hitler one of the people of the the century or something like that? Um, not because of what he, not because of you know the atrocities, but because of the influence and the way that he was able to influence a whole people in a country to do something. That was one of the the, the reasons it was on the table. Wow, that's scary to think about. Yeah. So. Uh, Vance says, you can't regulate stupidity or ignorance. That is very true. You cannot. <laughs> so, Yeah, but I think, you know, it's a good point, right? Like, Jay, like you said, at least the conversation can be had that some of these things are wrong, shouldn't be out and said, and, and definitely shouldn't uh, be publicized as, you know, big events, right? Mm -hmm. to, to speak on things that are just not right, you know? And I, I think, you know, more discussions, more positive discussions over these topics need to be had to where both sides, right, need to understand, I'm not going to walk, I probably won't walk away, walk away from this tonight being right. But let's try and see if we can both learn a little something today. And, and then the next time we meet, right, you know, we can have more of a cordial conversation, right, and then continue this so that we can make it better, right? 
uh, and have more decent conversations over some of these topics. Because uh, I think on both sides, sometimes it gets a little too extreme and then you get the frustration kicks in, right? And then the emotions kick in and then your common sense just takes the back seat, right? Right, yeah. And it, and, and it, it just becomes a big shouting match or a fight, you know, and it's crazy. Yeah, and everyone puts up the wall and yep. then nothing, nothing gets done. It's like you said, there's a shouting match at that point. And yeah, yeah, no, and, and I, I, tr I try to do it. I'm, I'm one who likes to get into Twitter discussions like that. <laughs> sure, it's not, not healthy for many, but I, I like to get into them. But um, You're a masochist. Yes. I, I, I am on some, especially some of the big topics. I like to go in and see where it is. Um, but then what it does is also lets me see where different opinions are coming from and try to, to, deal in that conversation in ways to get a little bit of a civility and i've and i've had some success in certain things where you go against some of these crazy far out there people on either side not not just right but some on the left as well right, right they're expecting you to meet them with that same level of vitriol but right. it's a situation by saying okay hold up i hear what you're saying but and maybe you can have a more productive conversation i, I think that sometimes works to a certain extent yeah, it, it's, it does. And to some, to some extent, some people are just dead set about against, you know, having any sort of thing and you just, it's all or nothing my way. And that's, that's either side that you're talking about. But if you can find that there's some common points there, then the, the conversation tends to soften a little bit. You know, you know, I agree with you on that point. I, I'm, I'm all for that. How about this? Or is, shouldn't it be this or this and that? And then now we have something that's a little bit different than just a, a, a knockdown drag out. Right. And that's how you get somewhere. You're trying to find some kind of common ground because we talked about the idea that most people at the end of the day basically want the same things. There's a lot of differences, of course, but most of the difference is in the nuance and the way things are talked about. There's more common ground to be found if you're willing to sit down with someone and find it. Hence the name of the show. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely thank you <laughs> and yeah you said we've talked about that a, a lot you know even in the in the in politics and the opposing sides you know you know there's a lot of a lot of overlap it's just how it's talked about exactly well we thank you martin for joining us and contributing to the nuanced discussion we like to have here you're a great guest and we appreciate everything that you're doing in woodhaven and the community at large thank you any closing words for us no yeah uh mike Jay, thank you for having me. You know, uh, this was a great conversation. Uh, and I think this is a great thing you're doing, right? You know, uh, I think when, I, when I, Mike Sunday we met, was it? Or Saturday, you know, when he dropped off the books, I was like, you know, it's just, you know, some conversations I had, and it goes back to how you have a conversation with someone, right? Um, and and you, you can lose people based off of how you're approaching that subject, right? Or how you're trying to tell that story. Um, you know, this comes across as just, you know, everyday average guys or people, you know, cause you had a female guest on here as well. So I use guys in general, right? You know, um, you know, people coming on and just having a conversation over some great topics, right? And, and this is how things can potentially get done, right? By having good, honest conversations with people. What we know, we're not gonna agree on everything, you know, but let's try and agree on having a great conversation. And I, and I appreciate you guys for doing this today. It was a great conversation. I appreciate you uh, reaching out so that I can highlight my community that I love. And I think everyone should take a chance. If you haven't been to Woodhaven, please come down. Um, you can definitely uh, see me at one of three places, Geordie's, Nears, or Pops. You know, that's <laughs> um, but we have a lot of other great places here in Woodhaven, uh, just like we do throughout our city. Um, but last thing, uh, get out, register, vote, let your voice be heard, get out to your local civics, make some noise, and make sure you get the right things you need for you and your family. Yes, absolutely. Thank you all for tuning in. We will catch you next time. All right.